that's out there. I'm with uh, Nathaniel uh, Silberschlag, a new principal horn of the Cleveland Orchestra. So uh, great to see you on here, Nathaniel. Welcome. Great to see you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. This is a, it's been a fun uh, COVID project. So yeah, um, and I'm sure we'll have some people uh, signing on here. So awesome. I want to just go ahead and ask you, uh, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but you come from an incredibly musical family. Yeah, I do. Um, man, I think at this point across the whole cousins and aunts and uncles were about 17 professional musicians in my family alone. Um, my brother is principal trumpet in the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. My parents met in the Jerusalem Symphony where my dad was principal trumpet. My mom was principal bassoon. Um, so they met in Jerusalem and then my dad won a position um, in the radio television of Italy as principal trumpet, the Torino Rai Orchestra. My uncles, Gerard Schwartz, my other uncles, John Manassi. So I get the list goes on. <laughs> I had no idea your uncle was Gerard Schwartz though. My uncle is indeed Gerard Schwartz. He married my mom's sister. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's incredible. I didn't realize that. So, so how old were you when you started to play horn? So I can't really truthfully say exactly when I remember because I started so young that I don't really remember. But my parents tell me that I was three years old and they actually, they had a horn made in Germany by Hoyer that was wrapped in extra time. So it was smaller and more compact. They, they wanted to get those brass players up and going fast. <laughs> wow, wow. And so did you do anything else musical like play piano or sing early? I do play piano. Um, and they started both my brother on and me on piano. I think around the same time we started playing our respective brass instruments. But yeah, um, horn and piano kind of cap out it for me. I wanted to begin a quarantine project of playing guitar, and I think I can only play about four chords. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all you need on guitar if you. Yeah, really exactly. <laughs> this would be basic. Yeah. So, so. Before we get into the, the stuff you did on horn early, I'm always curious about, like, did you learn solfege? I mean, was this sort of a, a, a discipline thing your parents did? It's not discipline in the harsh sense, but discipline in the... Yeah, you know, not really. I, I think that people, when they always think, oh, if you're from a musical family, that you've been forced to practice and forced to do everything musical, where my parents actually were basically the opposite. They... They homeschooled us, but not to, you know, have us strictly doing music, but they wanted us to be around what they were doing. And through that, my brother and I never really felt pressure to play our instruments or think musically. It was just what was happening. It was just like, that's a given. Like, I love how they play, they're playing music. I want to play some music. Like, let's do it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they, they never really, I, I can only probably count on my hand a couple of times when my dad said to me, go practice, but everything else was, you know, pretty voluntary. <laughs> right, right. I want to make sure this is still, it looks like we're still live. One of the buttons went out, but I think we're good. So, so, uh, and then you started when you were three on the horn. Yeah, right? yeah. So do you have any, like, when can you remember playing horn? Do you have any idea about when that was? Yeah, so one of my, first memories of playing horn. My dad runs a music festival in Alba, Italy. And um, as soon as I could play a major scale, he had us performing at that festival. So coincidentally, there's actually a piece by Morton Gould um, called Child Prodigy of all things. And it's basically a solo brass instrument backed up by brass ensemble. Um, and the solo, the solo, um, part is mainly just C major scales and the, the band behind you is doing all crazy sorts of stuff. Um, so that is really my very first memory, my very first vivid memory of performing, especially. Um, there's a great photo, it's probably on Facebook at this point, but of, actually of that very performance of my dad, he of course, he sat next to me while doing it because I, I was probably six or seven. I was probably a liability for just walking off and, you know, going to pee. <laughs> Right. Wow. Six or seven. And your brother is 
younger or older? He's older. My older. brother is five years older. Five years older. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm sure you guys were practicing like quite a bit when you were growing up. Together. Yeah, it was, it, you know, it's great motivation to be around a house of brass players and sadly for my mom, one woodwind player. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it was never really a competitive vibe between my brother or even my dad, but just like we motivate, we motivate each other. Even I just got back to Cleveland. I've been quarantining with them in Maryland uh, since March, basically. Um, and, you know, we'll be, we'll be just watching TV together. And one of us says, all right, I'm going to warm up. And, you know, it's like, oh, no, you, you can't warm up because I am going to have to warm up then. And then, you know, then he's going to have to warm up and then someone's going to start playing duets. And, you know, it just, there's a, it's a never ending wheel of motivating each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Though. Yeah. Do you remember, um, like, because you were playing so much so naturally early on, was there ever a point where you were like, okay, I'm getting serious about this. I need to be a little more disciplined or was it sort of more organic? You know, I think it was mostly organic. I, I, like I said, it was never like they were pressuring us to go into music, but it was just like, well, we're going into music. It was nothing. I mean, my, my parents are very worldly and <laughs> think of a lot of things, but, um, music was the way and it just kind of yeah kind of kept <laughs> so because of that because it was so organic like that was there ever a time as you got a little bit older and you knew you were going to do this did you kind of get into like a routine of how you're going to practice i mean was that definitely i think probably in my early i guess late middle school age early high school age when i was like okay well probably the next step is conservatory or something i probably made a kind of bet with myself that I was going to try to learn every horn excerpt in every excerpt book. Um, you know, my parents were playing us from every Mahler symphony and every Bruckner symphony. So I was hearing this awesome, you know, orchestral repertoire and all this amazing brass playing. And I just was like, well, I want to try playing that. I know it's a little early, but I want to get a head start. And so I think, yeah, probably in the early middle school, early high school, if I couldn't play an excerpt, I was certainly going to listen to it and get it in my ear. What, were there uh, orchestras or recordings that you remember being more prevalent than others? Like, was there a certain sound you were chasing? One hundred percent, there was. Um, I would say I'm very rooted in the Con Eight D horn tradition. Um, so the likes of Cleveland Orchestra, I would listen to so much Zell and so much Doc Nanyi with the Cleveland Orchestra. I would listen to New York Phil with Bernstein. I love that chamber sound. Um, but there was, it was a menagerie, there was a mix, but I would probably say, you know, the, I, I started actually playing after the Hoyer, I started playing on a Con 8D, so I think my parents were trying to tell me something, that I needed to start listening to Cleveland and start listening to New York and everyone that played in 8D. <laughs> wow, you really, it does seem like you were made for this job if you're yeah. <laughs> 8D. And when did you get an 8D? Do you remember? It was actually, so it was my mother's cousin Lisa's horn. It was like a classic case AD um, that she stopped playing horn in high school for whatever reason. She didn't, was a normal person, who didn't want to do music. <laughs> yeah, right. um, and they basically, it was kind of, they were, she gave it to my parents because we were rooted in music, but she gave it to my parents before either my brother and I were born. So. I think it's a little coincidental that there was a French horn lying around our basement up until the time where I could hold it. Um. <laughs> yeah. Is that the same horn you play now? It's not, no. Okay. Yeah. Another I AD. Have a, I have a different vintage AD, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what kind of materials were you working on when you were younger? I mean, since your father and your brother are both fantastic trumpet players, I mean, People should know, I mean, you, you mentioned the orchestra jobs, but your father recorded quite a bit of solo CDs, if I... Would yeah, say. yeah. Um, yeah, the, I think definitely my dad developed my embouchure, and he was my first primary teacher. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have some roots in Clark studies, you know, by Lynn, um, 
Schlossberg. I feel like I was probably introduced to the trumpet method books before I was introduced to horn method books, just because my dad figured, well, this translates to, you know, most everything. Um, but as I, as I developed and it seemed like, okay, well, he's going to play horn. I started studying with a really fine player and gentleman, um, that I still hold close to my heart today, Anthony Valerio, who is in the Naval, U.S. Naval Academy Band, and he was uh, horn faculty at St. Mary's College of Maryland when my dad is head of music. And I started having, you know, not weekly lessons because my parents didn't feel like I was ready for weekly lessons, but probably monthly or bi-monthly where, he, you know, he started showing me Coprosh Book 1, Coprosh Book 2, um, just get me into the roots of actual horn method books, even though I was tainted with trumpet method books. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And so, so which which books were you horn methods were you drawn to, like Farkas or Singer or definitely Farkas, definitely Kling, um, Koprosh Book One and Koprosh Book Two are like the Bible to me. Um, Oscar Franz method book, um, which is a great great piece. It's, you know, it's got a lot of method in the first half, and then the second half of the book is like all Italian lyrical etudes, which I still play actually a lot every day. Yeah. Especially in quarantine when you gotta stay in shape, gotta play something you're enjoying to play. <laughs> right, right, right. So what, so speaking of that, can you kind of talk about, well, we'll stay on your early life a little bit because I'm curious, like, so you're working all these trumpet books, you get into the horn books, and, and by what age would you say you really had your excerpts like on the, on the path, you know? I would say probably 14 or 15, I was really on the excerpt train. I was just so enthralled by the music my parents would play for us that I was just like, I gotta, I gotta start playing this stuff. I'm just gonna start printing stuff out. Or my dad, of course, you know, when the, when I first buzzed my lips, bought every single horn book possible, you know, excerpt book and method book, even though he wasn't showing it to me at first, they were there. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, I just kind of ran with it. I was just so into the, you know, the famous romantic orchestral works that I was like, I got to learn this. I, I got to start playing along with these recordings. <laughs> well, at what age were you able to transpose? When did that happen? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, I think, I, I think that starts trickling little by little. I think it's still trickling in. Um, <laughs> uh, I think probably before I got to my primary high school teacher, Sylvia Alamina, was, I, I could do the basics of transposing before I got to her. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah. And what was her reaction to that? Uh, you know, she, I think she was pleasantly surprised enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are definitely some crooks to iron out and, you know, the B flat alto horn, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But still, that's, that's pretty impressive. So by the time you were in high school, the transposition was... Yeah. In place. Yeah. yeah. Mostly in place. Yeah. <laughs> now, did you, did you all, because uh, where, where you guys grew up in Maryland, it wasn't exactly an urban center. Yeah, no, it's a very rural area. Um, where my home is, is probably like five minutes from Amish country, Maryland, actually. Um, so yeah, if I didn't have as worldly parents, I think I probably would have had a very different upbringing in Leonardtown, Maryland, but, you know, because my parents had lived in New York, had lived in Italy, had lived in Jerusalem, they were, I mean, outside of the college where my dad's primary job is now, you know, they, everything they do and everything they think about is in some, you know, metropolitan or big area um, outside of Leonardtown, Maryland. So although we were, yeah, I mean, I, I had to go take lessons in DC and Baltimore. There were no really primary horn teachers in Maryland. I mean, was there was there much chamber music in the house? Because I mean, you have two trumpet players and you and, and your mom playing bassoon. Definitely, we definitely read brass quartets. My mom, you know, drew the short straw and had to play the trombone parts. But um, you know, we definitely it was. And my mom plays piano too, so there was a lot of you know horn and trumpet and piano and a lot of mixed repertoire, I guess. And then, yeah, don't even get me started when you bring the cousins in. We had a whole other boatload of instruments. <laughs> wow. And, and I guess, I mean, uh, going back to Jerry Schwartz being your uncle, 
Yeah. Did you, did you play for him as you were growing up? I did. I did. I definitely did. And I cherish those lessons so much. I can think of, I mean, he's had a huge impact on my musical career, obviously, but I can think specifically, um, we had a Strauss horn concerto number two competition at Juilliard my sophomore year. And um, I was lucky enough to win, but I, you know, before prelims, finals, and the actual concerto, I was going over to his apartment on the east side, taking a cab over and just playing for him. Um, and I still think about the things he said to me in those lessons, like, almost on a daily basis. <laughs> Do you remember some of those things? Like, what kind of things were his, was his ear drawn to? Or Yeah, so I, I, one of the things I think, but probably almost all, every time I'm practicing is, so I... I got there, and of course I was nervous, like Uncle Jerry, I was, you know, it's a big deal, I had to go play for him. Um, and I, he said, okay, start and play the, play the first movement. I didn't know what that entailed, but I played, of course, the whole first movement, whole first movement. And of course, it, Strauss II is one of the most tiring pieces for horn players. And I get through the whole first movement, he says, terrific, terrific, terrific. Um, just one thing, when you take a breath, you can take any breath you want anywhere, as long as you make it a musical breath. And for me, that's been instrumental. I mean, I, to, to translate his words of wisdom, he, you know, every breath you take is either coming or going to a phrase. So whenever you take that breath, what happens before or after, you have to make it so that that breath that you're taking makes musical sense. Um, and I think about that so much on a daily basis, just I, I've taken a breath and I thought, well, did, did I complete the phrase or was this the start of the phrase or? <laughs> that's, 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 inc that's incredible insight. Did you, did you play for him before some of the auditions, like before Cleveland or? You know, I think just because of timing, I didn't really get to, there were times obviously that I went and I just played down the list for him. Um, but I think think right before I was my senior year was jam-packed um uh, in New York and DC <laughs> well yeah well, let's let's talk about that a little bit so when you went to Juilliard you studied with Julie Landsman right I the one and only I studied with Julie Landsman heck yeah so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to imagine that there was some Caruso in your life there is and always will be some Caruso <laughs> in my life <laughs> Can you, uh, can you talk about that a little bit about what it was like studying with Julie and some things you learned from her? And Yeah, it was, it was amazing. I, I, I don't think you can find many of Julie's students that say anything bad about her. It was just incredible. She is the horn guru. Um, I can't say enough good things about her. I was lucky. Um, so my relationship with Julie actually started way before college. Um, given that I was in a rural area, my parents were having a tough time kind of finding a horn teacher that they felt was good enough, of course. Um, and this was before I had even heard about Sylvia Alamina yet. And we were having some trouble and my mom said, well, you know, I went to Juilliard with Julie Landsman. Maybe I'll just call her and see if you'd consider teaching him. Right. And, um, so of course she called Julie Landman, you know, I've got this 12 year old son, he's playing horn. Would you consider, te consider teaching him? Of course not. No, I only teach my Juilliard studio and college students. Um, but because of the familial connection, she was so kind enough to give me a, like a Skype evaluation, like a, you know, maybe she could recommend a teacher for me. Um, and so for that lesson, of course, my parents, um, they said, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna play the opening of Strauss one, and you're gonna play then Ravel Piano Concerto excerpt, which is of course the very high excerpt, goes to high C, 12 year old should not be doing that. But of course my parents were like, you gotta impress her. So I, I did that and you know, I think it, it may have worked because <laughs> she, after that Skype lesson, she, she had just retired from the Met and she was actually playing some guest principal coincidentally in the Washington National Opera. So she said, you know, I think I'll be back and forth some, we'll stay connected. And when I'm in town, I'd love to, you know, meet him in person, give him a real lesson. And, you know, she is saintly for doing that, but I am forever grateful because those, 
we began to build a relationship and a Caruso relationship, especially um, pre Juilliard, that you know made transitions so much easier for me into college life because we already had this connection. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that was the beginning of my. I, I, I can talk about Julie for a while, but that was, we met in DC. Um, we had some Skype lessons, and then there was a time period where she was like, okay, I don't think I'll be in DC much longer. Um, I hope that, you know, he auditioned for Juilliard, but for now he should study with Sylvia Alamina, which is one of her closest friends. And Sylvia was second horn of the National Symphony, I think for 29 years. I, th okay. I think that's the right number. Don't quote me on that. Um, Sylvia, if you're watching, I'm sorry if I butchered that number, but it's a very long time she was in the National Symphony. And she is, again, I, I can't say enough nice things about Sylvia. She is, I, I, I say Julie and Sylvia are like second mothers to me. Um, but I, so I had a hiatus from, a little bit of hiatus from Julie, but she, she's, you know, stuck, stuck close guard and watched, you know, made sure everything was going well. And, you know, I got to study with Sylvia. I was, Syl Sylvia runs a brass group in Alexandria called Brass of Peace, mm -hmm. which is for like um, much above average high school age brass players. Um, so I, I cherish my time at Brass of Peace so much. Um, and from there, I actually was admitted to Juilliard a year early. So I auditioned at 16 and I went in at 17. Um, okay. Yeah. Wow. And by yeah. the way, Brass of Peace has had quite a, a number of excellent players come through there. Yeah, yeah. Nikki Cash was in Brass of Peace. Uh, Jen Montone was in Brass of Peace. Rex Richardson was in Brass of Peace. Yeah. The list goes yeah. on. <laughs> significant list. Yeah. A friend of mine, Steve Medancy, played in this group. Yeah. He was growing up and he was telling me, I, I, had, I didn't know about it, but it sounds like an incredible yeah they had it's group. amazing sylvia does an incredible thing for that group and then so you start juilliard when you're 17. yeah right now mm -hmm. so um there's i won't say who it is but there's a a horn player who now has a job in canada and her father is a famous horn player okay hackleman and I remember meeting her when she was auditioning at Cincinnati and yeah. I remember her saying, and it wasn't at all in any kind of cocky way, but it was like, I didn't know that people struggled on horn until I started taking horn auditions for college. <laughs> and I wonder a little bit like if that was like that for you, because you've just been surrounded by just great playing. And, and I mean, you know, was it, you know, you might not have struggled with some things or, or been exposed to struggle. Was there ever a yeah. moment like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I am grateful for my dad setting up like a very natural embouchure. Um, so yeah, I was grateful to not have to struggle um, with a lot of technical deficiencies. Um, but I was definitely whipped into shape for Julie, by Julie at Juilliard, 100%. I um i definitely you know recall an early lesson where you know she said you know you, you can't come up prepared to lesson you know who i am I'm, I'm jfl you know she didn't say jfl she was a little more explicit with it but you yeah. know that i it was it was you know it was it was i don't think that different a path than most got right um right she doesn't you know, try to treat her students differently than... Oh, no, no, no. Well, no yeah, no, but I, I totally get what you're saying. And yeah, it's, it definitely was eye-opening to be, you know, in Leonardtown, Maryland as, you know, the, probably the best horn player in Leonardtown, Maryland, um, you know, to be now in the Ju New York City Juilliard where there's so many talented horn players. Um, yeah. <laughs> so can you kind of talk a little bit, so while we're talking about Julie, can you kind of talk about the Caruso method and how you do it and, and the way you apply it and, and, and yeah. actually and when you do it in the day, I'm always curious about. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, again, being blessed from a trumpet player father, I had a little bit of Caruso expo exposure before I met Julie in DC the first time. Um, but yeah, I do Caruso every day. Um, 
that being said, probably my routine varies depending on, you know, what's going on. Um, I would say I probably have three core exercises. So it's the first thing I do. It's the first thing I start with is my Caruso's. Um, I start with the six notes, um, depending on, you know, what I'm playing in the orchestra that week or what I've got going on. It'll depend on which six notes I do as they're, especially in Julie's Caruso, adapted Caruso method, there are a lot of variations within the exercises. Um, so, you know, if I, if I have to, if there's, you know, if I'm playing pictures and I have to play the middle register solo, I'll probably, you know, instead of going just C to C, I'll go C to C and then still with the mouthpiece on my pressure and then I'll drop down to low G and then come back up to C, you know, to try to keep the facility in that register the smoothest. Um, so that is a core exercise I do every day is the Caruso six notes. Um, lips, mouthpiece, horn is just about the second thing I do every day. Again, varies on what you're doing in that week. And then the third thing is harmonic series. Again, has a lot of variations. Um, but yeah, I, so I, it's funny because when quarantine hit, I had to think, you know, okay, well, well, okay, back it up again. When I got the job in Cleveland, I'd think, okay, well, I probably gonna have to back off my routine a little bit because I'm doing, you know, an hour, hour and a half of Caruso every morning. Um, when you have to play first horn in a major symphony orchestra, that's gonna leave you a little too chopped for your rehearsal, possible double, possible dress and concert. Um, so I definitely had to adapt my routine um, actually with the help of Julie a lot, I, you know, I contact her every day for every, anything Caruso. I just, you know, what about this? What, what do you think about this shift? Or what do you think, you know, I, the, the learning never stops. <laughs> now, um, an hour and a half of Caruso, was that, or is there other stuff involved in an hour and a half or is that? Yeah, there, so I would guess. Sort of your routine, you mean? I guess my morning routine can vary from, a 30 minute session to like an hour and a half session. Um, most of the exercises in it are derived from Caruso, but there definitely are, like I'll mix in randomly, the trumpet player in me, I'll you know do a Caruso exercise and then I'll do an Arbin, Art of Phrase uh, study, just you know, get the music in me going, get the air flowing, try to play, you know, above a forte, try to get all the juices flowing. Cause you know, Caruso's are a very, very vertical type of playing where, you know, you're going up and down the horn, you're, you're trying to make sure your facility and all the notes are there that you need, but it's not a lot of horizontal playing. Right. So. Yeah. 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 And then you still keep in touch with her all the time. With oh her. yeah. We, uh, we talk over text at least almost every day. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> she means she's such a master teacher and, and such a sweet yeah person yeah it's yeah, she is the best <laughs> yeah that's incredible it's and so yeah so caruso is such a big part and you mix in the trumpet playing what you know and then so now like well before we get to that i want to back up and, and talk about the first audition that you won yeah out of the huge number i think you told me it was three <laughs> uh well you don't have the sky miles i guess from the audition <laughs> You know, but uh, talk about the audition you won with the uh, Washington National Opera. Yeah, um, so it was my junior year. Um, so I was, I was a year early, so I was still 19. And I basically, at the beginning of the year, Julie and I set a goal, obviously not to win the audition, but at the end of the semester, or I think it, the audition happened in December. So it was right before winter break. You know, the first half of the semester, your goal at the end, to play this audition, go take this audition. Um, and so everything surrounding, you know, in my lessons, of course, we would do Caruso, we'd do facility, but then we'd touch on an excerpt from the list that I didn't know yet, or we need, needed more work. And then what was awesome is that in studio class, you know, we, other people in the studio would also take the audition. So the audition could, I mean, the class could range from, okay, we're gonna learn these excerpts together, or okay, next week we're all gonna mock, um, or 
you know, Nathaniel's going to mock uh, or he's going to do a adversity training where we're going to like throw stuff at you while you're trying to play these excerpts, which is stuff that is so, so helpful. And the studio environment that Julie creates for an audition like that is awesome. And I credit her 100%. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, so I prepared all, all half the semester, not to say that I was preparing to like, oh man, like I'm going to go win this audition. Like I want to, but like, no, like I am taking this audition. I not trying to put too many expectations on myself. It's my second audition. Um, so yeah, I think probably that helped me a lot, not, you know, trying to put too much pressure on myself to actually win, but actually like I wanted to see how far I progressed um, in this time period over the semester. Um, and it was blind all the way through. And I, I'm trying to think, I think it was a, I think it was just a prelim, a semi and a final. Final, we played Mozart with piano. Um, and then, yeah, I, I was revealed. I think they were probably a little surprised. They invited me out for a drink after and I said, well, sorry, my dad's waiting and I have to go home now. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I am so grateful for my time in that orchestra. I love the people. I love the orchestra. I love the place. Um, I still probably talk to the, I, not probably, I, I talk to the principal horn, Jeff Pilkington, every day. Um, if, if he hasn't texted me, I have to check, make sure everything's okay, like he hasn't died or something. Um, so, yeah, that was the audition part of it. What was the, um, so, so you were still in school, though, when you were playing the gig, is that right? Yeah, so I won it in the middle of my junior year, and I didn't start until the end of the junior year, and then my senior year was completely split um, between living in New York and D.C. I actually didn't have um, in the New York apartment my senior year, I basically couch surfed with my friends whenever I needed to be in New York, and I lived in D.C., basically. Did they still make you play an orchestra at Juilliard your senior year? They did. I did. I played. Yeah. How did you that audition? <laughs> 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 so, wow, that's a, that's a crazy uh, a bit of commuting, though. Yeah, it was. I mean, I think that I should be customer number one on Amtrak at this point. I can't tell you how many um, trains I took. Uh, even actually, my well, the, one of the last productions I did with them was Tosca. And I, I, I'm trying to think exactly how it went. I think it was, I played a night Tosca, and then I took a 3 a.m. train to New York City, got there at 6 a.m., had to get to Juilliard, I think, by 8 a.m., because it was graduation, and I was going to walk. I, w I wanted to walk so badly. Um, so I, I got to Juilliard, I think, around 8 or 9 a.m., did the whole thing, did the shablam of walking, got my diploma, turned in my mailbox key, had to get on a 1 p.m. train to play tomorrow night's Tosca that same night. So that was probably the sleepiest I have been performing, but, you know, worth it. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible what a yeah so during that time on the train i would imagine yeah. you had time to think a lot too so yeah it, it kind of want to meld into the sort of the next thing which was like the mental aspect of your playing and the, the visualization because i know that's a big thing for you yeah for sure um so yeah i guess it was I want to say the middle of senior year, but it was probably more towards the end of senior year where I got an email from the Cleveland Orchestra, um, you know, inquiring if I was interested in auditioning. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not interested. Of course I was interested. Um, and uh, yeah, so those train rides were filled with a lot of things. And it's funny you mentioned because I remember a lot of my planning was based on, Oh, I got to do this thing, but I'm so tired. It's fine. I'll do it on the train. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, yeah, so I was, you know, playing a new opera every month. I was writing papers. I was playing lab orchestra. Um, and I, then the add on top of that, I was preparing a whole entire principal horn list for the Cleveland Orchestra. 
So I can't tell you how much positive visualization helps me and it's one of my, I, I champion it honestly. So there was so much time spent on the train where I would just, i.e. score study, mm -hmm. I would listen to the music, I would sit there in quiet and just try to think about things going positively, which I think is maybe the most important thing I did on the train because, you know, I think you can, with big opportunities, you can easily fall into the thought of negative thought and just, uh, this isn't going to go well, like it could go well, but whatever. Um, and I really tried to keep those voices out. I tried to really, you know, this is going to be great. Like, this is what I want. This is what they want. You know, I just, you know, telling yourself all these things that may or may not be true that, you know, help your brain, you know, get you there. It's like, once you're, once you've pounded your brain with positive visualization on the day, it's like, you know what, actually, I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen go well. I think it's actually going to go well. <laughs> is there a point where that, that came into your life? I mean, was that something that you kind of grew up with or do you remember like maybe something in school really impacted? So I can once again praise Julie Landsman. She brought positive visualization into my life. Um, she, I'm not sure if you're aware, she is big on like meditating and energy medicine. I don't know if the, Don, the name Donna Eden rings any bells. Um, so yeah, meditating and energy medicine, which positive visualization falls very much under the umbrella, is something that she and I worked on a lot. And I think some of my, my not my favorite, but some of my lessons I'm most grateful for, and I still use, the end of the lesson, she would create a guided meditation for me, or whatever was happening. I know, I remember vividly, after I won the Kennedy Center job, um, I had a lesson with her saying, you know, gosh, I, it's not that I don't feel ready. I just, I worry about what my colleagues think. You know, I'm, I'm so young. I'm 19. I worry if they don't have faith in that I can do it. And, you know, all the normal worries that you would think one would have going into a job that young. Um, and she said, all right, well, let's, let's create a guided meditation for you. Um, where she basically, basically I sit there and I meditate to what she then records on my phone for me, which I still have and I've got them saved in probably four different hard drives to make sure they never go away. Um, because those are, the, it's super instrumental because there's the days where the positive visualization is really hard for yourself to tap into. Um, like even the negative train is running wild and you just sit down and you can listen to this guided meditation of someone saying, you know, your colleagues will trust you. They already trust you. You know, all these things that, again, may or may not be true, but help your brain hear these things and kind of absorb it like a sponge so that your brain at least feels ready, which is, I think, more than half the battle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah. Were there, were, was she into recommending any books or were there things like that you read or that you kind of used? Yeah, I mean, she was big on Don Green, like the inner game of tennis, which is awesome. Um, she would, yeah, she would definitely point you in directions of things that she was also finding. Um, I can't say other than Don Green, there were a lot of other specific names, but like on a weekly basis, she could say, okay, hey, like I found this great guided meditation, I'm gonna send it to you. Or, like, hey, I found this really interesting article on positive visualization. Still along, um, yeah, yeah. That's that's really incredible. That's that's uh, it's not a usual thing in a studio teacher. To yeah, definitely not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that uh, inner game of tennis was just pounded into my head. I'm so grateful for it, but that's yeah, constantly is just really unusual. And then yeah, so you're you know you're preparing all this stuff, and and then talk about the Cleveland Orchestra process. You know? Yeah, I mean, it was, again, it all happened literally so fast. And uh, at the beginning of quarantine, I was almost grateful um, to have a, have a breather because I went from, you know, sophomore, junior, senior year, straight into Cleveland Orchestra from Kennedy Center in senior year. Um, it all happened so fast. I don't think I even had a chance to like digest and 
you know, take a step back and think about what's happened. Um, you know, your parents have been telling you you're going to be a principal horn and a major symphony orchestra your whole life, and then wait, it it, it happened. <laughs> wow. um, so, yeah, it was a it was a wild time and a I, I don't want to say wild process because it wasn't a wild process, um, but it was a wild time and um, yeah, I had I had two auditions. One was in Miami and one was in Cleveland for the entire what you know what felt to me like the entire Cleveland orchestra in the audience but I'm sure it was just the principal horn committee uh, and Franz uh, and you know I I played what was like 25 minutes or so on stage and they just come back and I say all right well I'm gonna give you the job are you, are you cool with that <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, I, I I think I don't think I realized what they were saying at the time, but I was like, yeah, I'm very cool with that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and I guess that was in March, and then I started playing with them in August at Blossom, and um, from August Blossom, felt like I the next thing I played was modified practically. We my first official week on the job was uh, Prokofiev for Romain Juliet. I think it was act one. And then the second week was modified. So oh. you know, they, don't, they don't ease you into it. No, it, was not, it wasn't <laughs> uh, work hardening, as they say. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was straight into the shoot. Well, what, do you remember, talk about the audition a little bit itself, the one in, well, you had, you, they heard you play in Miami because the orchestra yeah. goes or right. goes to Miami yeah. a little bit. Um, and the next time you talk to Sachs, you should ask him about getting run over by the Kardashian sisters. In okay. <laughs> I will. <laughs> but uh, we got run over by the Kardashian sisters in Miami. Yeah. So it's, it was very strange. But yeah. uh, so talk about that audition. Was that, that was just to hear you for the first time. Do you remember what you played at, at that audition? Yeah, I, I basically it was uh, kind of a choose your own poison from their major principal horn lessons. They bring two solos and like five or so excerpts or something. Um, and I played Mozart. I brought Mozart for and Strauss too, which is what I brought to the Cleveland audition as well. Um, and I played, I played Brahms two, first movement. I played Brahms three, the big one. Um, I, the Cleveland audition, the repertoire is a little more in my head, but I played Tchaikovsky five and I played Till, I think, for that audition. And then for the Cleveland audition, I didn't really know what to expect. They basically just said, um, here's our principal horn audition list, which is just not excerpts, it's just, you know, every symphonic master work known to man on one page piece of paper um, <laughs> yeah. so that's also where the positive visualization came in so key because you know I was working at the Kennedy Center I was playing at school I was still having lessons I was writing papers so of course I practiced the audition list but I didn't have the face all the time to be shedding the excerpts hours and hours on end of the day I had hours and hours of opera to play um, so you know, visualizing, playing those excerpts, and obviously listening to the pieces, so if you haven't played the part, at least you know what it sounds like, um, was so huge, but so yeah, I got that giant list, didn't know what to expect, um, and they don't, the way they run auditions, they don't, like as some auditions you would, you all huddle up around like a bulletin um, to see what list is being posted, but they don't do that, they have their librarian, Bob O'Brien, awesome guy, um, they have them sit next to you, and then as the committee decides, they just, they, they basically tell Bob what piece to put in front of you, um, and I don't, I played Mozart four again, um, I played some Bach B minor mass, I played some Till, I played a bunch of Mahler five, um, I, I wonder why they knew it was coming up. <laughs> did, you have, did you have the whole part of Mahler five? prepared really well mostly you're yeah. expecting that I would, I would imagine. yeah i mean that one is a, i i feel like at least the whole 
third movement you a horn player has to know by heart <laughs> um and then i think i played some trickets in five and then famously ended on the long call they didn't they didn't go easy on me with short call they gave me long call so <laughs> right. wow and so it was that was that the one round and then they they told yeah. you yeah and uh yeah you must have been like you said a minute ago just completely shocked you know oh yeah i was just uh, you know they many rich king you know horn hero of mine was shaking my hands and you know saying congrats like you're awesome and i was like no you're awesome <laughs> <laughs> um so do you on the job now do you talk to rich i mean you guys does you ask it oh, or yeah i mean no i mean rich is rich is awesome he's one of my favorite people i mean you could think that someone in that position could take a negative connotation but to the new principal, but he is just the nicest man and like has been the most supportive. Um, so we've we've got on really well. And um, I like to say, you know, bring, try to bring a positive vibe and hopefully the positive vibe is brought onto you. And I think that is 100%. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so when they came out, it did, uh, who told you you won? Was it Franz or was it the person? Yeah, it was Franz, yeah. And I got in Franz's office, and then they brought me out to meet the committee. <laughs> wow, what was what was Franz's comment to you when you when you went to his office? Do you remember much about that? I, you know, I think I was in a very very surreal shock state, but I do remember him, you know, saying like, "Do you, do you think you're up for it?" And uh, I was like, "Well, yes, <laughs> I, I think so." <laughs> Fantastic, and, yeah. and and so then, like you said, like then you're on the job and you start at Blossom. And we were talking a little bit before we got on, like your what was it? Your second week was like an all John Williams. Yeah, well, so our, my second or third week, I can't remember exactly, was full Empire Strikes Back with the movie. So it was the whole soundtrack, which was probably one of the most fun I ever had playing horn. I, mean, I think. Of course, I play horn because my parents had ready for me. But if you ask my dad, he owes John Williams to me playing horn because of how enthralled I was with John Williams and the movies and the music and being like, that's horn. Like, I, I can hear horn. That's a, that's a horn. Um, so that was just a blast. And just sit next to Sax playing Star Wars was like a dream come true. I was like, this is epic. <laughs> And you guys are very similar with the positive attitude. And, and of course, he's a giant John Wooden fan, which kind of bleeds into a lot of the mental stuff that you've talked about. Yeah. Inspiration. I mean, I'm sure that week you were very grateful for all the Caruso time. with the, Oh, my uh, gosh. Right, yes. Right, right? Yeah, I was very. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so like you said, like this, the first week is Romeo and Juliet and the next week is Mahler 5. Yeah. I mean, because uh, and I was at, I mean, I we talked about it. it was at that show in new york i mean and i was thinking oh my god if i was you were 21 at that point right 22 maybe i was 21 yeah you're 21 and it's it, it tell it, for people that they don't realize this like you know a lot of times the horn solo is playing the back in the in the third movement but yeah in this case there's a in there a mingleberg letter to Mahler that or yeah the, Mahler wrote to exactly Mahler, think, right Mahler Mahler wanted the obligato part to come stand in front it actually doesn't state, I think, whether they're standing or whether they're sitting, but they're in front. <laughs> right. And so, yeah. and, and when did you find out that that was going to happen? So that's actually funny. Um, was my, obviously I was busy learning Romeo and Juliet, practicing it, but that week, obviously my focus was like, okay, Mahler 5 is next week. So I was shedding it all week, you know, sitting down, sitting down. And then we had a, actually, oh my gosh, I'm, I've already forgot, I've already, you know, it's all a blur, but we, with that Romeo and Juliet week, we had a gala on top in that same week playing Rosencap Suite, um, which huge horn, you know, hits in that one. And so I would think it was, it was right after the gala that I was walking off stage and Franz, you know, pulled me aside and was like, you know, I, I want you to stand in front, if that's all right with you. And I, I think I just said, what you, do you want me to sit or stand? Like, I was just like, <laughs> I tried to, you know, just take it in stride. I think it, it's, it's interesting because I feel like the pressure of that moment honestly helped. It was like, it's going to sound strange, but it became such a, like a 
pressurized and, you know, high stakes moment for me that I was like, well, you know, I can just do my best. And I, uh, you know, I can just go there, try my best and, uh, you know, hope and positive, positively visualize it happening greatly. Um, and I, you know, I, that's what I try to do day in, day out. And with the modified, especially I, you know, I, I think it was, uh, it helped me to stand in front because I figured, well, this, this is my moment. Like this is, I got to seize the moment. Um, you know, I felt so privileged. I was like, this is, you know, my favorite orchestras of all time, you know, playing one of my favorite pieces of all time. Like who's got it better than me right now? Like, just go have fun. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that moment? Like when the, for the first time in the, in the rehearsal, like, do you remember that, that first rehearsal when the piece started going, here we go. Was yeah, that... I mean, again, like it was epic to like sit next to one of my heroes, sax playing like just freaking awesome Mahler five next to me while like, you know, slightly intimidating that was to hear how amazing it was next to me. It was like, this is exciting. Like, I, this is revving me up. Um, and yeah, I think the, the first rehearsal, um, we finished the second movement and I, I didn't stall. I, I didn't want there to be any awkward moment of like someone like having to call me up or like, you know, come on up or like get out of your, get, get off your ass. Um, I just, I was like, okay, well, third movement, let's go. And I, I just, I waltzed up there. They had to stand there and took, and there, it, took and it in stride. There, yeah. And there it was. And, and it, I mean, that's obviously such a big solo. Um, did Franz, give any instructions with that or it just seemed sort of like a natural way um, or anything? he had he had co small comments um here and there but he was mostly letting me do my thing um which was just awesome he i couldn't have wished for someone to treat me better on the podium in that moment like he was incredible um <laughs> i just i felt so honored and i just felt everyone i mean i I think I've said, but like I felt the warm energy from every single person in the orchestra. Like everyone wanted me to succeed. I didn't feel anyone like, you know, wishing me wrong. I really felt the incredible support and, you know, warmth and welcoming from everyone in the orchestra, especially Franz on the podium. It just was like, they, I, I could feel it. And it was yeah. big. You know, you don't want everyone to feel like people are not in your corner. So after the, the first, during the first concert, when you finish that movement, yeah, you know, obviously you get to sit down and there's a yeah. piano. Were you like, oh, I'm just. <laughs> well, it's funny because it, it, it well actually I will say I finished the thing and I was like, okay, well I'll just walk back now, and I could notice Alan Di Mattia, who's a one of my favorite people, is the sweetest man, sweetest heart. Um, he's a horn player in the orchestra and I, I could see behind his chair like he was he had his hand up he was trying to give me like a high five like a, the <laughs> most discreet high five one could ever do in Carnegie Hall um but it's funny because you want to let your energy down so badly after that third movement and you yeah naturally like it's like oh oh my god like I just that was an adrenaline rush and then of course after this whole glorious Mahler five adagietto by the Cleveland Orchestra strings. You have to start. The horn player has to just go. Whoo. So I really like I I allowed myself probably to I I actually tried to plan it out pretty calculated because I knew that of course I would be drained after the third movement. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna totally relax for the first half of the adagietto, and then I'm gonna go back into you know. Um, performance mode is what Julie calls it back into performance mode and back in it and I'm emptying my slides I'm trying to taste the concert a that I'm about to play so it's a it was a little bit of a letdown of energy but then oh man you gotta ramp it back up <laughs> yeah 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 the whole another movement <laughs> and and then of course the thing ends and and people went nuts for you and it was a, a huge huge deal I mean and you you played it in severance earlier in the week right or was yeah we played it twice at severance um right before we took it to carnegie 
Right. Um, yeah, I mean, just about probably every, since I went to Juilliard and of course every one of my family members we're going to try to be there. Basically, everyone I knew was at the Carnegie concert. <laughs> no, my, no so, my, yeah, my high school teacher, Sylvia Almina, she came from D.C. My whole Kennedy Center Horn section, they came from D.C. Oh. Uh, to, yeah, I mean, my parents, Uncle Jerry was there. They were, they were all there. Um, wow. Yeah. And did you- <laughs> Did you sleep like 12 hours that night after you? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, I slept like a baby. Uh, I went out with my family after. um, And then I caught up with the Kennedy Center horns and my second horn, Jesse McCormick. Um, Yeah, it was a it was fun and was I didn't try to celebrate too hard because we had to get on a plane uh, the next day. And I think we had a one day buffer and then we had straight into Prokofi of six, which unbeknownst to me before being in the Cleveland Orchestra has a lot of horn in it. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that, so could you kind of maybe walk people through like what's a week, like a heavy week for you, like a per- Mahler or Prokofia for Shostakovich Symphony and talk about when is your recovery? When do you start to ramp up? When do you start to tail off a little bit? Yeah. So I would say that our a normal week for us looks like Tuesday to Sunday, Tuesdays to Saturday sometimes, but usually Tuesdays to Sunday, Mondays are always our day off. Um, and I try to stay, obviously I try to learn a lot of the rep before the season starts, but I'm trying to stay a week ahead of everything. So if we're doing Berkuffy, if this week I'm at home practicing Mod 5 because I've practiced for coffee of last week um and so yeah like what you said with recovery it's what i'm for now realizing and still learning that it's it's a blow obviously and you have to take your time of just revitalizing your chops when you can like you can't just pound your face on your face okay well I have a day off I'm gonna pound your face practicing you can't do that or you're just gonna burn out um so I definitely if we have a two-day off situation like if we have a Sunday Monday I may even take Sunday off from playing I'll still study and then Monday I'll ramp it back up but our usual week has something on Sunday um so it's usually matinee and I won't play the rest of Sunday and then I will do on my Monday morning um some Crusoe recovery exercises. Um, I think in Julie's PDF online, which is free, you can find the recovery exercises, which are awesome. Um, I'll do some recovery exercises. I'll do some, you know, Clarks. I'll do some chromatics. Just easy, easy, trying to keep the pressure off. Um, just trying to, you know, loosen it back up after tightening it all week. Um, and yeah, I will try to touch the coming week's music on Monday, you know, get all the hits or whatever, um, make sure all my assistant markings are all good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I, at least I would have hoped to super uber prepare that the week before so that Monday I can kind of chill, um, yeah. at least playing wise. I'll still study because, you know, any conservatory life, you everyone gets to play what they get to play so you don't I, I you know i've played more i've probably tripled my orchestral repertoire um pieces that i've played in just what was like the first half or more than first half of my first season before covid shut everything down um so yeah i mean if you're in the cooling orchestra for five years you've probably played most every master work four or five times already and at least where I am I gotta at least study it long enough that I can it seems like I've played it five times <laughs> right 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 and so when you study now I mean so you're you know you're having rehearsals you're having a double and you're still listening to stuff and checking it out in between and at night or and stuff like that so uh is there anything away from the horn that you do to kind of have to peel back a little bit because that can be a lot you know or do you even have time for that? It sounds like that's a crazy. Well, this first year definitely, like, I 
am again grateful for some of quarantine to figure out like what am I going to do to relax and take a step back because a lot of it you know obviously I was stressed doing the job my first year and I was I didn't I didn't see many social interactions I mean I was lucky enough to befriend the principal clarinet very quickly um I'm actually in his home right now because I moved out of my apartment pre COVID. And now that I'm back in Cleveland, I'm staying with him before I find my next place. But um, what was I saying? You were talking about uh, pulling back a little bit and trying to figure out how to. All right. Yeah. Um, sanity a little bit. Yeah. So the, the year was crazy and I was just learning, learning, learning. Um, but I definitely have, you know, membership to probably every streaming service at this point. I mean, I don't think I have Apple TV plus yet, but there's some yeah. things on there that look like I'm going to have to get it. Right. Um, there's a Tom Hanks movie you want to see on there. I think. Yes. That's, Oh my gosh. You're so, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'll kick back, you know, stream. I love sports. I, uh, uh, it's not the biggest, I, I don't think it's my most addable quality to my, new Cleveland colleagues, but I'm a huge Baltimore Ravens fan. Um, so that is an unpopular opinion in the locker room. Are you still a uh, Yankees fan? I am no longer a Yankees fan. Um, but that is a good, that is good, good knowledge. Cause I, uh, you, you did, you did your homework. Cause I haven't. <laughs> I, I grew up a Yankees fan too. And yeah. It's, it's challenging now that Jeter's left. So. Yes. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Um, but yeah, I think I want to say that I'm a Baltimore Orioles fan. I mean, I was for a very long time. I am, but they're so depressing that, you know, I am leaning on going towards the Cleveland baseball team now. I know the name is unpopular at this point, but. Well, I, if you kind of were like down with the Nationals, right, that'd be the National League, and then it's not really cheating. Right. This is true. This My is true. Favorite. Yeah. But it's funny because my dad's from Maryland. That's why we never went to the D.C. sports teams. Got it. Got even it. though we were in closer proximity to them. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, other things that I try to do, I try to stay active any way I can. I'm not – I do not love going to the gym. So I just I, – I try to do things outside. I try to do things at home. Just being like a potato for too long makes me not right. happy. <laughs> yeah, you know, another question I had, and I and I think, I mean, you probably have a, a jump start on this because you know you're you're around your parents who are professional musicians and your brother. But what what advice would you have for somebody who wins a job of any of any size or type? But you you, know, you step into that situation in an orchestra and everybody's older, and then not everybody handles things exactly the right way. What what was some of the advice you were given or? or things that you know that you were helpful in that? Yeah, I would say, these were conversations I had with Julie and my parents and, you know, everyone close to me and that, that I think of as a mentor. And I would just say what I said earlier, you know, I was getting myself, you know, really wrapped into what it's going to be like, you know, how are they going to accept me? How is everyone going to view me? I'm so young and I'm in a leadership position now. And I, you know, I had to get all that crap out of my head and I just had to, you know, say, look, I can only control me. I can own, that's the, and that's, the, that's the only thing I can do. And I just went in there and I was like, you know what, I'm going to have a positive attitude. I'm going to be positive and as nice and warm a person as I can be and hope it, you know, spreads and wears off. And I would, that's what I would say for someone going to that sort of type of situation is number one, you know, try to enjoy it and like cherish, like actually this is really cool and this is really awesome. Um, and just, you know, be yourself. I mean, not to some tacky, be yourself. Don't be yourself if you're really mean and like not, like <laughs> don't d put on a mask and you know, just <laughs> yeah, <fake>. try to, <laughs> but you know, yeah, just try to, Try to have fun and like enjoy the moment. <laughs> yeah, life is precious. We can't go outside anymore. <laughs> and hopefully, we'll be able to play again soon. Yeah. In, in yeah. Well, what um, what what plans do you have? Any plans like 
I mean, I know this is your first year in the orchestra, but like, have you thought down the road, like, do you have any plans as far as like chamber music or solo recordings or anything like that? Is that anything that's been on your brain? You know, I, I love chamber music, obviously. Um, and I would love to do a Reinecke trio for clarinet, horn and piano with my friend Effendi. I think that would be the funnest thing. But aside from my brother making us do some quarantine video recordings, um, which I'm very grateful to him for because, you know, he, we, we got home and we're like, well, we can't just sit here and do nothing. Um, we made some actually really cool videos that we're both pretty proud of. Um, it started off as, you know, my dad runs a music festival in St. Mary's and, you know, he had to go digital because he can't have the concerts. So we had to program some stuff, you know, what are we gonna do, we're just gonna play. Um, but past that, I have no real recording yeah. aspirations at this point. Right, your, your schedule keeps you busy enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You by the way, and, and kind of floating back to uh, the, the beginning of the Cleveland time, there's a question I would ask. Do you remember, um, do you remember calling your parents when you won? Yeah. What was that like? <laughs> that was pretty special. Um, you know, I don't think it was, I don't think I got the shock value as much as I wanted because, as I said, you know, they, they have been telling themselves, you know, our son's going to be principal trumpet and principal horns and major symphony in orchestra. They've been telling themselves, they've been telling us that our whole lives. So I guess it didn't exactly come as a shock to them. Yeah. But, you know, it, they were thrilled. Obviously, they were, like, overjoyed. Um, my, my dad wanted to immediately move to Cleveland. He's still trying to bug me because that I'm looking for a you know, rental or house. You know, he keeps saying, you know, make sure I have a bathroom, make, make sure I have my own bed away from your mother is, is joking, but <laughs> <laughs> so they were, they were all in from, from the get go. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so what would you say is like, uh, what would you say is like maybe your favorite part of, of playing in that brass section? You better answer this right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think for me the sound it's so big and natural um and it's you know such a warm and big and natural welcoming sound um and the musicianship and i mean it's it not to you know blow smoke up someone's butt but like seriously sitting next to like a couple of my horn heroes and trumpet heroes brass legends like rich and sax like it's awesome like it's it's surreal for a lot of the time i'm like wait like is, is this going down like we're, we're playing together right now um so it's awesome and yeah i mean the big naturalness of the sound i thoroughly enjoy how is that i man Big and natural is always the way to go, man. <laughs> what are, you know. <laughs> so, hey, man, and you're, you fit right in, man. You know. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are busting my chops. You know, where's, where's Mike Miller in all this anyways? <laughs> no, but, no, but it's true, man. I mean, look, I mean, for, I mean the first show you played was, was Brahms. I mean, you probably already got in this, you know, you, you first show you played was with Brahms one out of Blossom you know yeah. you walk in and it's like yeah I mean yeah big and natural is exactly the way it went man it's like you, you sound strong man and it's, it's you know I mean whatever for you know for everybody watching I mean for me one of the greatest things has been to have Nathaniel come along and I you know I'm not, I don't want to embarrass him too much but I will anyways it's like you know, from the first moment he sat in the orchestra, it's like, it sounded like you, you'd been in the orchestra for 10 years already. I mean, it's just, it's just, you sound fit, your whole countenance, your whole presence is just, you know, it's so positive and fun and you're just knocking the, the bejesus out of everything. I mean, standing up front doing dollar five, your second subscription with the music director and he has you come up front and 
you know, and everything you've done, man. It's just, uh, I mean, the only drag about this, this whole COVID period, I mean, one of the major drags for me has been missing hearing you. You know, it's been hugely inspiring for me. And, you know, not like I'm some old fart that's, you know, hanging on for dear life. All the time. No, man, it's inspiring, man. You know, to, you know to come in and you sound like you've been there for, for 10 years and playing with a ton of confidence and exuberance and, you know, I could bust your chops, you know, about, you know, you know, your, you know your water bottle all the time. And, you know, is there it is. Hydrated? You gotta be careful, man. Yeah, take a drink, man. You don't want to, you don't want to get dehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. I'm, you'll never know how much that means to me hearing you say that. <laughs> oh, man, it's like, it's just, it's, it's, it's great. And that's, that, that to me is one of the great things that, you know, I mean, when I started, I was, you know, I was 26. I was basically your age. And hopefully I was that for the Dave Zouders and the John Max and the Alkovskis and, you know, some of those older guys. And now, you know, the shoe's on the other foot, man. And I'm the exact age Zouder was when I got in a section and you're about four years younger than I was when I got here. Yeah, you know, that's, that's what it's all about is that cycle. And then, you you know, hopefully we, but, you know, we bolt your butt to the chair for the next 40 years or ever. <laughs> Hey, sign me up. And you know, and you know, I'll bring the hammer. I, I hop on, you know, Pegasus into the sunset, and so, you know, and, you know, it's yours, man. And, I'll bring, I'll bring the hammer. And you and whoever, you know, you and whoever, you know, comes after me can run the shop. You know, <laughs> that's what it's about, man. Is that is that cycle of things and. You know, and uh, yeah, it's also, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the first part of this. I'm looking forward to going back and, you know, catching up on it. Hopefully, Mr. Doolin. I, Mr. You know, by the way, there was a hitch uh, for a little bit in the live part of it. So there's like a, it'll be like two segments. But when it goes on YouTube, it'll all be there because I've recorded all of it. So that's no problem. But all right. uh, what, what were you going to say, Mike? I'm sorry. I just want to make sure you've been like showing my, my, my younger brother here kindness. Always. <laughs> for sure. Always. <laughs> reference and kindness <laughs> always always well you know, you know talking, talking more and more about you know how big and natural the sound is and how <laughs> you know, we all look man that's we all aspire for it man that's that's what it's about i mean he was, yeah he wasn't wrong you're playing brookner i mean that's that's what it's all about man yeah truthfully I mean, Mike, we'll talk about that a little bit when you, you know, you know, you've had several young players come in the orchestra and especially somebody like Nathaniel here that comes in and just not only what it does for you, but what it does for the whole section when you have that kind of energy, you know, because if oh, you're yeah. with the same people every day, day in and day out for years, and, and it can get a little bit, not stale is the wrong word for the Cleveland Orchestra, but with any organization, there'd be a bit of that, you know, what does that, what does that do? For the brass section as a whole well you know anytime there's a new player you're talking about something come someone coming in with a little bit different point of view someone who obviously we feel fits our style and fits among us already otherwise we wouldn't be giving them that you know offering that opportunity but either way it's somebody who's coming in with a different a different perspective a different you know way of doing things a different um, experience, you know, from what they've been doing you know, from, I mean, no one's, no two people's experiences are identical. So to me, it's an opportunity to infuse kind of a breath of fresh air for everybody and some new perspectives and an opportunity for everyone to kind of evolve. And, you know, over time, you know, the brass section as it is right now with these particular people is one place. And then with any new player, it's, it's like an amoeba. It kind of shifts a little and evolves a little and, grows a little bit with, with each new player. And that's kind of the beauty of it. I mean, I've, you know, thinking about it now at this point, there's only one member of the brass section who was there before I was. And yet I don't feel like it was, it's that much off of this kind of continuum of a very similar kind of a tonal concept, a very similar kind of a, you know, integration within the orchestra just based on the way the orchestra plays in the acoustical space we play in, in Severance Hall for the most part. But it's still, yet it has evolved. I mean, the same way that Bernie Adelstein, my predecessor, was a phenomenal player. But I don't necessarily play exactly like Bernie. 
And Jack Suddy is a sp- spectacular second trumpet player. And Dave Zouder was a spectacular second trumpet, but Dave and, and Jack didn't play exactly alike. But yet there are certain things that Jack does in his playing that's very similar to what Dave did in his playing that's spectacular. And it's a reason it works. And the same thing, I think, with me and Bernie. And the same thing with somebody like Nathaniel and Rich. You know, yeah, I, you don't want, we don't, you don't want to be, I didn't want to be Bernie. You don't want to be Rich. You need to be Nathaniel. But yet, there's certain things you can gleam. It's like there's a reason he was successful or the reason Bernie was successful. And I've already seen you like pick up on that without even saying a word. You pick up on certain stylistic things. Like when you first got in the orchestra, what, what kind of things did you pick up on immediately? Man, I, I think the length of a phrase is like one of the first things that I thought about. Um, because I, I, obviously I thought about long phrases, but like, I don't think I heard as long a phrase as I did when I first sat down. And honestly, I think it was, we played Romeo and Juliet, like my first subscription week, and you've got that lovely cornet solo. I can't tell you which scene it's in, but like, I just thought about how long you took that phrase and like, or just the meaning in like every, I, I don't want to say, um, what's the word? It was like the music between the notes, that you carried the phrase, not only not only each note was beautiful but in between the notes there was still a carry within the music along the whole phrase which i was like that that (laughs) i was like i want to do that (laughs) and for for me it was the same thing when i first heard john mack play yeah you know i was just like oh yeah okay I yeah. need, I want to do that. Yeah. I need to figure yeah. out how to do that. So I'm, look, I'm honored that, you know. Thanks. Well, I, well, I, yeah, I'm, past I'm yeah, I, I mentioned to Mark uh, earlier, I was like, well, I don't think it's a coincidence that like the number one orchestra I listened to growing up was Cleveland. So <laughs> I was about to bring that up, Michael. What could you talk about the fact how fortunate, obviously Nathaniel's playing, but just having somebody that played an 8D come into this situation like that i mean that's you know because they're not as common as some other i mean it's like i think with trumpet we have like a sound or two and i feel like with horn you have like a sound or eight or nine you know and <laughs> the fact that there man definitely yeah I mean, yeah i mean you've got guys who are playing like you know schmitz and geyers and you know a little bit lighter horns like that and then like the engelbert schmitz and you know, and and then you've got, you know, Yamahas and these and Paxmans and what, whatever other stuff is out there, and there's a lot of different stuff. But but the 8D is a very particular sound, and that how has always been the sound of this this particular horn section, where it's you know My, Myron Bloom going from Mike Bloom to Rick Solis to to Rich uh, Richard King, and now now Nathaniel, and you know that was. I mean, it, it's funny during the process, I have to say, I wasn't necessarily thinking to myself, okay, we're not going to hire anybody unless they play an 8D. I was looking for somebody who had a very particular voice that I felt would fit with us. And I didn't care what instrument they played. My, my whole thing was they could play in a guard nose with a funnel if it sounded great. <laughs> but, but it's just, but it's just, it's just the right sound that would fit us that the style that the guys who were here would mesh. And I mean, if it fit with the orchestra, it would fit with the guys here. It would fit with the way we play in the trumpet section, the trombone section. Yasu, our incredible tuba player. You know, it would fit within that, that sound scope of the brass section. So I wasn't really hooked on the horn, but or, or, or type of horn or maker of the horn, but it just happened to be what Nathaniel played. That it just it, it just happened to work. It just happened to all fall into place, which made the transition very easy. So it wasn't a situation where the other guys felt like they had to get new horns. They had to change their style. I mean, it just Nathaniel kind of just slid right in. And like I said, it was like within the first rehearsal, everything just kind of went boop. And you know, it's like okay, you know, I mean, I mean, literally the first rehearsal of Brahms one. It's like within the first you know ten minutes, I'm like. I look at Janchich, our timpani, our principal timpani player. I'm like, 
<laughs> this isn't anything we need to worry about. This, is, you know, and it's just that's, you know, that's the way it works. But you know, it just happened that way. We were lucky, but but then again, it's just I'm, I'm not so hooked on the actual instrument. Although an 8D does make a particular sound, so it's it's not by coincidence that that kind of worked out that way. Yeah, just like a Bach makes a particular sound. Yeah, Bach makes a particular sound. A Yamaha makes a particular sound. A Geyer horn makes a particular sound. A Paxman triple makes a particular sound. You know, and it's just different, different soundscapes, different environments and acoustics, different orchestra styles and music directors over time. So. You know, well, that speaking, as well. speaking of sounds, Nathaniel, was there, can you pinpoint, you know, you listened to a lot of Cleveland Orchestra recordings growing up. Can you pinpoint maybe two or three that you would say really keyed in with you about the sound that you want to make that maybe you go back to or have gone back to over and over? Yeah, I definitely can. Um, I think the one recording that I listen to most, probably to think about like the horn sound, is this recording of Myron Bloom uh, with Zell playing Rossini Il Turco in Italia? It's this Rossini, it's this Rossini opera, but they played the overture. And it's got this awesome horn solo in the beginning. And it's just, man, he plays the heck out of it. It's so epic. Um, just like he's just singing through his horn. Like he's just like trying to sing. He's like putting out, it's like he's he's like, all right, well, I'm the tenor now. I'm gonna take over. And it's just so awesome. Um, so it, it's also a hidden gem. I don't know. I think it actually, for a while, there was through our like 8D community, there was like a bootleg of it. But I think now it like finally hit YouTube. Um, so if you look up Turco in Italia um, by Rossini, by the Cleveland Orchestra, I think you should be able to find it. So that is one. Um, what other? There's countless of Shaik Fives um, that I've listened to, Blooms, Solus. Um, I, and I like worship those guys growing up. I was like that. They're just like, I mean, man, some recording of Solace also just like, just giving it, like playing with such abandon and like just going for it. It's just like so inspiring. The Solace um, would be the Mazelle, right? Yeah. I mean, also. And some probably, of the early Doc Nani. Yeah. Yeah. yeah most of Mazelle and early Doc Nani. That's all, that's all Rick. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you, the whole Mazel Romeo and Juliet, um, is so awesome. Um, especially the horn playing, like, there's this one, there's this one, I think it's just called, like, Interlude. Um, but it's like, it's, it's like, rum, bum, 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 rum, bum, bum, and man, like, Solus plays the heck out of it. And I like really got that in my ear. And when we played it, actually, I remember the first rehearsal, like I, I just had that so in my ear. Like I played it really hot and I was like, whoa. I was like, maybe I should maybe back off like a second on that. <laughs> Except then Franz looked at you with a big grin on his face. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, that'll work. <laughs> Yeah, and I had a grin on my face too because I'm tacit during that movement. I'm like, <laughs> you know, but, but the thing is, I, what I love about that is like, you'll do something like that and be like, all right, all right, I got to stop up here, man. <laughs> oh, I, gotta, I can't be dragging down, dragging the team down here. <laughs> Step up or my moment comes. So, so, Nathaniel, was there anything, I mean, obviously every week with that, Orchestra is, can be a musical highlight, but was was there anything that you guys didn't do this year that you were just like chomping at the bit to do? What were what were your things you couldn't wait to do that now you had to put a pause on? Well, I will say there were a lot of things honestly that I was looking forward to doing. Um, I think number one, I can easily say the John Williams concert that we were going to do. Um, I was like a kid in a candy shop for that one. I was like so rearing to go. Um, that is probably number one on my wish list to get. One of the first things we do when we get back. Um, I was really looking for, we played certain acts of Romeo and Juliet throughout the season in preparation for when we were going to play the whole darn thing in Abu Dhabi. 
um, which I, was going to be really cool. I've never, never, been to, never even been to the Middle East. Um, so I was super excited for that. Um, and I think the obvious choice for me is probably, I think our season got canned like two or three days before we were supposed to play Czech five. Something, something like that. It was, it was like a very short window. So I was gearing and ready to go to play Czech five. Um, but that got, as we all know. It, that kind of reminds me too, because you were an assistant principal in Washington National. Mm -hmm. How do you feel like that informed the way you use an assistant in the orchestra? Huh, that is a good question. You know, I think it definitely made me appreciate the assistant like 100%. Um, Jeff Bilkton, the principal there, he was so great at keeping me involved and like keeping me playing where I have had experienced the opposite in a lot of different times, you know, Juilliard Orchestra where you're just like sitting there doing nothing and then you're like oh well I gotta play quickly and it's like you're not one up or anything I think a lot of a lot of the job um for assisting a lot of the job of the principals uh, is you know making sure that the assistant is playing enough and like you know they're playing in obviously correct moments but like if you have a big assistant moment that you need them to do like you don't want them to have been not play for the last 20 minutes or something and then yeah, you will play this one really quiet note while I take a breath and play the rest of the solo um you got to keep them engaged you got to keep them involved um or it's easy to just you know sit there and get cold um so yeah I, I definitely like really appreciate the job of the assistant because like it's so important <laughs> it is a huge deal <laughs> Michael what what other uh when, you know, we were going back to the, the sound of the brass section. Would you say, you know, you said it's organic, sort of like an amoeba. What kind of um, things have you noticed in the way of, uh, has anything changed in terms of articulation or, or volume that you've noticed? Well, you mean over my whole time in the orchestra? Well, we could say that. Yeah, but I was thinking about more recently since Nathaniel's been there. But yeah, maybe oh. overall, like, you know, you've been there for five or six years now. What would that, that be? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I can, I can speak first with Nathaniel coming in. You know, because we hadn't had a principal for a while, you know, the section wasn't nearly as cohesive as it was when, you know, Rich was in the, in the chair. I mean, anytime you've got a principal in the chair and it's consistent and it's solid, and some people is as great as Rich, you know, is a spectacular, spectacular player, that really helps everything come into place. So having Nathaniel come in, usually, you know, in any situation when a principal player comes in and all of a sudden the section just goes zoop and everything lines up, it actually the section isn't playing louder, but it comes off much stronger with more presence because all the overtones are there because you hear all the voices very evenly and so together and so in tune and so on the mark with style that it's like it's like one of those things like it's an exponential formula instead of having six individuals you have six to the sixth power so it has it's actually said it being this big it ends up being that big so it actually has more presence to it which i actually really like because it gives me some stuff to kind of latch on to when, at certain points or, or vice versa. It just gives me more support when I need it. Yeah. Depending on what's going on. And then over time, um, it's interesting because when I, when I first started, there were still a number of guys who played with Zell. I mean, a number of guys. Um, and the Zell guys had a tendency to play a little bit more percussively with articulation. I mean, Zell wanted things very crystalline and very clear. And I would say probably one of the bigger changes just stylistically in general for most orchestras in the last 35 years has been to kind of smooth things out. In some cases, I feel like it goes too far because one of the things I liked about the guys with the Zell acumen was there was a really great rhythmic underpinning in everything they played with. And this is actually something that, that Suddy does great, that Zouder did great is playing i mean i mean jack plays there's a lot of rhythmic kind of substance to what he you know and it's not playing in rhythm it's not that 
is this his, his, his playing has a lot of rhythm to it, the way he articulates, the way he places notes that, that Zouder did as well. It's almost like kind of tympanistic that as a principal player, it's very easy to just go, just kind of just go bang along with it. And, you know, I think that's been a little bit of a change. It's evolved a little bit, but there, there's still some of that. But I think really a lot of, a lot of the sound has become more, more vocally oriented, more singing oriented. Not that those guys weren't making beautiful sounds. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the orchestra 35 years ago can play as beautifully as the orchestra now. You know, most definitely. And it's just the rhythmic orientation, the ensemble orientation is slightly evolved over time in a different way. And it's kind of, you know, do you like, do you like green or blue? You know, what, which color do you like? You know, they're both beautiful, but which do you like? So it's kind of been a little bit of that and, you know, a little bit note length, a little articulation, but there's still this sense, the overriding sense is that there's playing absolute, just literally what's on the music, and there's playing acoustically. What's going to appropriately fit the acoustic so that by the time it gets to the conductor and ultimately out into the hall, that it's together and it, and it fits properly. So those things can be slightly different. But, you know, that orientation, not as many people have as they once did. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's some of his different music directors. Some of it's just kind of, kind of just, you know, how people listen to music now. Nathaniel, did you notice any of those changes when you got in the chair? Like any little adjustments you wound up making or, or listening for a little bit differently? You know, I think that's the biggest thing is that I, I'm always, obviously always trying to listen to my playing, but I think the biggest probably change in myself was, well, I got to listen to everything around me more than I'm actually listening to just myself. Um, because yeah, you can work on how you sound as much as you want at home, but like you are playing, you know, a organ, an organism that is supposed to sound like one single unit. And if you're not listening to, you know, literally everything that's happening around you, whether you're playing with the string as the horn, playing with the wooden or playing with the brass section, it's ever changing. Um, so that was probably the biggest difference for me. I mean, obviously I, you know, in school I was trying to listen, but it was, it's different type of listening. Uh, yeah. Just trying to be, have my senses open and aware 24 <laughs> seven. I think when we were talking to, like when we were talking to Gabor last week, that was a, a thing he brought up. You remember they were talking about playing the end of Mahler six and he heard his colleagues playing one thing and he was kind of shocked. And then when he listened to the recording, he's like, oh, that's why they did that. You know, it was, it was a, a change like that. So that sounds like the, a similar kind of description. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, that's now. Do you do you go back and listen to the broadcast that you've done and since you've been there and try to make any adaptations or or? Listen yeah, to I have gone to the archive room a couple of times. Um, yeah, and definitely, definitely tried to listen to as much as I can get my hands on as possible. Um, yeah. yeah. It's huge. Yeah, so much. Um, I don't know. That was that was sort of my list of questions. I didn't know how, <laughs> I didn't know how big or natural this interview was. Well, I mean, you guys have been going for a while, so it's pretty big. And I mean, you know. <clears throat> An hour and 40 minutes, and he's only played on the job, what, like half a year? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it feels like longer, man. You know, it's, it's – that's – you know, but man, you got plenty of time, man. You're gonna you're gonna light it up, and I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys I'm, I'm gonna sign off and let you guys just kind of kind of have a little bit more time, just the two of you guys. But well, I'll just hang on for a minute. We'll wrap it up, and then we'll all right. Anywhere. All right, I'm not gonna go anywhere, but I just want to say real quick for anybody who's listening to this, or, or you know, now live or later, you know, I had heard of Nathaniel when he was you know freshman at Juilliard. I started hearing from some of my my, my buddies over there that you know, or where, what's going on. And, you know, we're listening to him and, you know, they were like this, this, you know, this is a guy to look out for. And, you know, as we're looking for, you know, for a while for a horn player, we're looking and looking and finally, you know, we got the opportunity that, you know, things intersected that we were still looking and, 
you know, I got, I got, I got word, you know, basically from Julie Landsman saying he's ready, you know, <laughs> looking, you know, he's ready. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's good. All right. <laughs> Such a wheels in motion. And, you know, he, you know, Nathaniel took care of the rest, but you know, you see certain people come along every 12, 15 years or so with each instrument that are like kind of a once in a generation kind of player. And, or if you're lucky, maybe there's a couple of them, you know, that, you know, usually, usually come in bunches, you know, maybe, maybe two or three, but you know, there's certain people that kind of lead a generation of, of players. And, you know, I mean, already I could say that, I mean, the Mahler five that, you know, Nathaniel played, I've heard, every great player played either live or in recording. And what you threw down was as fine a Mahler five as anyone's ever going to play. And, you know, you, you know, you are that kind of once in a generation dude that, you know, and it's just, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, it makes me not that I'm going to like hang on for dear life. Cause I don't want to be, you know, you know, Michael Jordan playing for the wizards, but you know, <laughs> You know, not that I'm Michael Jordan, but yeah, I don't want to be that that guy, you know, or you Johnny know, Unitas playing for Brett Favre playing for the Jets or something, you know, or whatever, you know, just anyhow. I can just only say that I'm so grateful to have you in my corner along the way. <laughs> you know, truth is easy. And it, <laughs> it is, man. You just, you know, you just knock it out, you knock it out with enthusiasm, and that comes through in your playing. And it's infectious and it's inspiring. And, it, you know, I just want to stick around as long as I possibly can to see what you do, because, you know, I can't wait to hear what you do at 32, 42, <laughs> around long enough to see you at 52. You know? <laughs> Thanks, man. That means but, really uh, so much. It's, it's, that it's exciting for me. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm only, I'm only sorry. I'm not 38 instead of 58. <laughs> okay, me man. too. <laughs> that I got but <laughs> anyhow it's just that's you know and I'm just I'm just really excited because you have that curiosity and that kind of you know motivation and determination that I see in your eyes and I see in the way you carry yourself at work and the way you do it that it's fun but there's still there's a determination to really seek out information and try to evolve your playing and, and you know always making it better and that's you know, you can't buy that. Thanks. Thanks, man. Really. Huge props and admiration and respect for that, man. Thanks. Huge. Thanks. Yeah, it man. means so much. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm, I'm so glad we got you on, man, because we went, you know, we talked about a lot of stuff for anybody that's kind of checking this out right now after there was like a little glitch in the beginning. I mean, just talking about what your life was like growing up. I didn't know that Jerry Schwartz was your uncle. Uh, not everybody mm -hmm. has Jerry Schwartz as their uncle, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, like role model, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was, a, I mean, pe people see him as a conductor. He was a, he, he's a great musician. He was a fantastic, a phenomenal trumpet player. Talk about, talk about determined. <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> did he, did, did, did your uncle talk about, uh, you know, playing in the Philharmonic with you? I mean, was this, were these kind of things talked about? I mean, I, I, okay, I, my family growing up was not going to be discussing like New York Philharmonic and Cleveland Orchestra recordings. I mean, what was yeah. like, what were the holidays like? I mean, what was... I mean, Passover is at the Schwartz's always. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you got to stick around any one of my family members and you got to just listen with an open ear and you're going to get a tidbit of some sort of gold information, honestly. Um, yeah. I, I can't say that he really would go on about, you know, his time in the Philharmonic. He's very, a man, very present in the moment, very present on what he's doing currently. Um, but yeah, I mean, but I mean, your folks too. I mean, they both had incredible careers as players. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't go to bed without receiving a tip, or so, or some some sort of tidbit of you know gold that they're trying to get across, and I'm grateful for it, obviously. Um, yeah. Well, all right. Well, 
I want to come to Passover or something at your house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got you got my invite, so you're good. <laughs> you do, man. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you guys can come. We'll, <laughs> we'll be there. That's, that sounds great. That's Sweet. <laughs> well, uh, I tell you what, you guys stick on a little bit, and but I'll I'll sign us off of Facebook. But thanks so much to everybody who's watched, and uh, hopefully you'll be hearing Mr. Sachs and uh, Mr. Silverslog. Did I say it right again? That time you said silver, but you know, it's okay. But say it for everybody just so they know. Zilberschlag. <laughs> Zilberschlag. Very good. <laughs> so thanks everybody that watched and uh, we'll see you uh, next week with uh, Jose Sibaja. So, awesome. Very good. And I'll stop.